So there is the um, there is the um, uh, one thing that I did not uh, mention in this highly theoretical. Uh, by the way, this sort of the thoughts that went into this sort of thinking of functions and thinking of processes as functions and their inverses is, is hi was highly influenced by a paper from uh, Anthony Galton, uh, who is a is a mathematician philosopher working or interested in cognitive science and GI science, and uh, worked out a number of, of very nice theoretical papers about this, which, which come with real examples, but not with implementations. Um, uh, but he's, he's great in conceptualizing these things. Um, the, uh, the example here, uh, so this, the reason why this is meaningful, yes, from going from here to here, is basically that we know for these points that we know what the so-called observation window is. And that's the country boundary in this case. Yes? So we know for this process that within this boundary we have all objects. So the thing we know is that whenever we go somewhere within this boundary where there is no object, that there is no object. Yes? So it's exhaustive. So there is no object, there is no power plant, there are no emissions. So we can sum them, right? And the sum reflects then to a property of this polygon, which is the observation window. So the term observation window is used a lot in point processes. So point processes is the area of the branch of, uh, or, or point pattern analysis is the branch of spatial statistics that worries about points where, you know, where events, where, where objects occur, where events happen like disease cases and so on. Uh, and, and whether this is random or whether this has some, you know, some relationship to known factors or is, is non-random and so on. Um, less, less so in interpolation problems. In interpolation, you don't see this often. You don't see, you don't often see an observation window. So you could, uh, you could, of course, say, well, I have a database and I will select all the German stations and it will interpolate for Germany. But if there's an area like here, uh, where I have very few measurements, you could as well take measurements across the border that were taken here in the Netherlands or here in Denmark, right? Why not? Because it's a field. So the field is not, uh, you know, is not uh, sensitive to administrative borders. The process, borders. The process is not. You know, the process doesn't stop at the borders. So this is for the European Environmental Agency and for people doing environmental computations very, very difficult to understand that in my sort of national air quality indicator number, measurements from other countries would appear. This is very difficult for them. Yes, I'm not kidding. Yes, this is, this is sensitive. Yes? So um, you could do an estimate, you could do an estimate of the mean value for the area to estimate that mean value, you would have to make predictions. You have to go here, do predictions, where you get their errors, the error, sort of error, standard errors of the predictions. You get the covariances of the errors of the, stand, of the predictions. You average all the predictions, and you get the, uh, the standard error of the, of the average, right? Which is the average for the whole area. It's called block region, yeah? So you can do it in one step. You can do it in two steps, but it's complicated. You can do it in one step. And then you get the average for an area. And for this average, of course, you can take values into account that are outside the area. You don't have to, yes? It's just that things work better when you do, because values just outside the area are informative about what happens with the field at, at the boundary areas. So it improves things. Of course, you also, you also get some dependencies, right? Your estimate for uh, Germany and for Poland will not be completely independent if they are based on, you know, if they share observations. You get some, some dependence, but, but, but that is not a problem, of course, right? So uh, then the question is sort of what does, this, what does the border mean? Well, the border means that uh, sometimes you want to have a number, an average number for a country, yes? And if you want an average number for a country, you have to integrate over the country, you have to integrate the process, so interpolate and then average. Um, if you would compute this number, if you, if you would compute the mean number, it would be the mean for the for this set of stations. So in that sense, what we say there is observation window, the observation window for the objects 
means that for this area, for this country, I have these objects are all the objects there are, I know there are no more. This is not the case here. I could take as many measurements as I, as I would. So for this set of points, the corresponding observation window, we argue in the meaningful paper, is the set of points. So these set of points, is these locations, are the locations for which we observed. For any other locations, we did not observe and we don't know. There is not a zero value. Or there is a value which we don't know. So the observation window is not, you know, it's not really a window, but it's basically the collection of observations, the collection of, of stations. Collection of these stations is the observation window. The line in primarily is not, is not relevant here. Um, and, and so we basically, the, so the spatial statistics literature there sort of typically has chapters on, on point pattern analysis and has a chapter on geostatistics, which, which concerns with fields and interpolation and, and prediction and so on. So often there is not a very good introductory chapter that tells you you have to, you know, with your data you have to open the book there, and with your data you have to open the book there, and there is this sort of data where it's, um, um, where it's not always uh, unambiguous whether we have objects or fields, as I mentioned. Uh, if you look further into this example of air quality, we discussed this over, over the lunch break. Um, the interest, of course, is not so much uh, PM10 over Europe. The interest is PM10, or air quality, where we live, right? And we live for 95% in cities, and, and a lot of people travel through, you know, through heavy traffic situation. That is why they're heavy traffic. So these two lines are very relevant when we think of exposure. So the numbers we really would like to know is the degree to which a population is exposed to certain air quality levels. And then the, the sort of the upper two lines are sort of that is again an integration problem and a very difficult one with, with very large unknowns. And, and you need to do a lot of model assumptions there. Uh, so I was going to say, say a bit more about R now, uh, because this is the so spatial temporal data about R. Um, I will do it like this. I will sort of say first a few things about data frames, what they are, how they work, and what sort of concepts we try to, to copy. Um, then I will say something about time, about time series, about space, about spatial data, and then about spatial temporal data, and then we will look at Tom's data. Yes. So let's see how this goes. Um, so, to start off with, uh, I said I will assume you understand this, but I will go through this very slowly. Uh, I will first understand, try to un explain why it is useful to understand uh, what a list is. So, a list is, um, list is a function that creates a list. Yeah? So, I now made uh, an object yes, of class list, and that's the empty list. And lists are important in uh, R because they are the kind of the most generic data structure. They can contain anything, yes? And most things you work with in R, if they're data objects, they're, you know, nearly almost lists. The thing is that you don't have to worry about it too much, that it's a list, right? So you hopefully it's something more useful like a data frame. But then data frames are lists, and it's, and it's useful to understand a little bit their connection. So lists uh, essentially uh, have a length, yes? So they have a number of elements. So I could make a list uh, which has two elements, uh, a number and um, a, 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 what is this? A char it's not a character string. It's, it, well, it's a... Well, basically, a number is, uh, it's not even a number. It's everything, uh, sort of uh, elementary data, are vectors. Yeah? So if I say a two, I have two here, then you say it starts here with a one, sort of saying, oh, I have a vector. The first element of this vector is two. Yeah? So the, all the data in R is, is, is sort of vector-oriented. So unlike uh, C, C++, Java, and even databases, where you think records, right? Uh, you don't think records here, you think vectors. 
So this is not a strange idea. Uh, SAP has recently is or is sort of going big with its sub HANA, its its column store. So big data databases are essentially going to the direction of instead of record oriented relational database structures, going to column stores. Right. So I'll, I'll get there in a, I'll get there in a second. Um, so we have here a list of two elements, a number, which is essentially a factor of length one, yes, and, uh, and a, uh, um, a, an, an element of mode character, so a word, so to speak, which is a character vector, also of length one. Yes, so I could bo both make them of length two, so I have C23 and C foo buzz, right? So I have a factor of length two here and a factor of length two here. But it's completely arbitrary what is there, yes? There can be anything else that could be a, a logical or something like that. And there can be whatever, you can put anything in, you can put anything really in lists. You can even put functions in lists, but I will not talk about that. Um, so lists are, are, are collections of, they are used to collect uh, data. And now um, the, um, the sort of the, 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 uh, 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 f mm, two properties you you need are, are, are that are useful uh, to know are that lists have a length, um, and so this list has three elements. So it means it has three list elements, and you see that the list element may be a factor of another length, right? Um, a second thing is that I can do selection, yes. Um, and the selection of lists work with the square brackets. And there are two types of selections. One is that where I use the single brackets. Yes. And there you can see that what I get back is a list of length one, right, with this factor. So the single bracket selector here <coughs> returns me a list. So if I take the first two elements, yes, I get a list of length two. Yes, with the first two elements. Um, another selector I can do is uh, the double square selector. So first the first square selector to see the difference. This gives me back a list. If I do the double bracket selector, yes, it gives me the contents of the first list element. Yeah, so it does not return a list, yes, but it gives me what is in, what is the first list element, not the list with the first element, but the contents of it. Yeah? So you see that this is a, uh, another thing. Yes? It's a numeric factor of length two. Um, so this is important to, uh, to understand that there is a, 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 a single square bracket which returns lists, elements, and a, and a double square bracket. You can also uh, select things by name. So I can uh, create named lists. Um, and then where I first saw this, I saw them numbered. I now see the names. X is this, Y is this, and I'll leave, leave the third element unnamed, so you see that I get the named elements, and you see that it's, it's mentioned with a dollar, right? A dollar, dollar, X, dollar, Y, and the third one is, uh, you see here, the, the, the double square bracket, three indicating the contents of the third element, so it's not named, yes? So it can be named, unnamed, mixed, and so on. Doesn't matter, lists can, you know, accept everything. When I have names, I can also use these names to select, and I can, for instance, say, well, give me element X, yes? And it gives me element X. Yeah, so that's convenient if I name my things in a list so I can find them back easier, right? Instead of remember which position they have. This looks a little tedious. Uh, so you need six characters, bracket, bracket, double quote, double quote, bracket, bracket. Um, and there is an abbreviation for that. And that is the dollar, right? You already saw that revealed here. Um, here, dollar X. Yes, I can use a dollar X. That is exactly identical, yeah? So that is a syntactical shortcut to double bracket with quoted names. Yeah, so I can leave out the quotes, I can leave out the double brackets, and it makes life much easier if I can do that. So I drill down into the list element and see the list element. 
Yeah, so these things are useful to uh, understand, especially because the most common or a very common data structure that we use in R is the data frame. And data frames are lists. Yes? Data frames are lists of columns with equal length. Col lists of vectors. And the vectors, we think of vectors as columns in a, in a table. Uh, at least that is always how we, you know, how we print them and so on, of course. Column is not a concept of in a, in a computer, right? So it's, it's our mental, you know, our mental understanding. We always look at data like, like as columns, variables on columns. So um, I can um, create now a list uh, and sort of, you know, put this thing in X. Yeah, so X is this list. And then, well, let's see if I can make a data frame for, out of this. Uh, it even works, right? What you can see here is that it uh, makes data, made a data frame out of this list. It made this third element longer, right? So it replicated the third element as often as the other two uh, are. Yes. So um, it's probably you know goes wrong if there's an uneven number and so on. But but you know we would argue this is not not very useful. But um, Anyway, if I have named elements in a list like this, uh, and I say, well, make that a data frame, uh, then I get this data frame. Yeah, so I have this data frame. Um, and you could ask, is this a data frame? Um, I always ask the class from things if I don't know what it is. Yes, it's a data frame. And you could ask, is this a list? Yes, it's a list too. Yeah, so data frame is a list. Yeah, so anything you can do on the on the list, I can do on a data frame too. So I can address variables by name. Yes, or I can address variables by double quotes and names. Or I can address variables by double quotes and their position. Yes, and I get these things. Ah, here something changed, you see? Something has changed. So I had a list here where the elements were text, were character vectors. <laughs> yes. R tries to be smart, right? And people disagree whether this is good or bad. Strong, there is sort of heated debates about whether this is a good thing. So I went through this by the function s.dataframe. So I pulled x through the function s.dataframe and saved the result as, a, as an object called df. And it has changed the contents because we can see that class df2 is of mode vector, whereas class of x2 is of mode character. So it has, it has m transformed character, so textual information, into factors. And this is probably documented. And it has, so it has a, it has a, it has a, it even, I can even, so it has a parameter, this function has a parameter as data frame, has a parameter strings as factors. And the default for that is a default dot strings as factors. So I can even, uh, so this was probably relatively recently introduced after the heated debate. Um, my default setting for strings as factors is true. But I can, if I search a bit longer, I can, I'm quite sure I can find a way to you know, for once and for all, eternally instruct my R on my machine to never do this, yes, so that the default will be false. Of course, when then when I then uh, communicate my script to you and the default is set to true, you will see a different result. So, you know, whether this is good or not, but you could sort of put the default settings at the start of your script, or you could even in the S data frame, you could sort of leave it empty. So when I did, when I did this, I could say, uh, strings as factors is false, and the f do would be of mode character. Yes, I can I can manipulate these things, but a data frame sort of uh, as a default in R tend to tend to think well if it's character data I'll as, I'll interpret it as a factor. So who of you does not know what a factor is? Yes, a bit explanation is helpful here. A factor is who? What, who can explain what a factor is? Reversed, reversed extreme. 
Yes. Right. It's a variable that has an attribute called levels. What kind of variable? What is the variable? It should be categorical. Yeah, so it's interpreted as categorical. So it's a numerical variable. It is, so it represents categories. So if I have categories red, blue, green, then these repeat a lot, and it's, it's sort of, you know, instead of doing all the text comparison, it's easier to store them as numbers, one, two, three, and, and remember that one represents red, two represent blue, and three represents green. So it's, it's, a, it's an optimization thing. You can, of course, all categorical information can store everything as character, but then you get into problems with typos and so on, and you get into... So it is so, uh, indeed, so... Um, factor of this thing uh, is... Um, is a numerical variable, so it has numbers, I can convert it to the numbers, and you see that it's two and one, the levels are al alphabetic, and it also has levels, and levels are these two. So it, it's a way to store categorical data, where the categories repeat. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't do it for names of persons, doesn't make sense, but a lot of statistical data that comes in with names, like land use types or so, right? There's 10 types and there are 5 million observations. Why store them as text and repeat it all the time, right? So it's, an, it's, it's much more efficient for... And of course, you never know in advance what is what, whether it's again, right? Whether the character data is, is unique names or whether they're categories. It assumes they're categories and, and you can override it. Okay, so... Then, uh, so, so data frames are lists, so everything works on list, works from the data frame. Then data frames are a bit more, because we, we tend to see them as, uh, as um, um, you know, we tend to interpret them as, as things having records, right? Where sort of the first element here sort of together form a record, and these two together form a record. Of course they don't, they're just two factors. This is a factor, and this is a factor. This is how the data structure is organized. But data frames are a little bit more you know, friendly, and for instance, let you uh, select the first record. Yeah, so that is a good thing. Um, where a list would not do that, right? What, what do I have in X? Still this thing. So doesn't do that. It doesn't understand this. Right. So that is what a data frame does. So you can do positive selection. You can do negative selection. Um, oops. That means I remove uh, a record, one or more. If I have negative indices, I remove them. I can also select a variable, um, and it works like this. And here you see that what I get back then is a vector, right? If I would select both variables, it can't be put in a record, so I, can, I, I get the whole data frame back. Uh, if I only select one variable, I get back a vector, so not a data frame. Yeah? So that is, you could say, well, why don't you do it? Why, what is this unfriendly? I could instruct the selector here to say, well, don't simplify things. That is the drop is false argument. Don't simplify things, so even if I, if I select one column, one variable, don't simplify this to a vector, but return me a one-column data frame. Yes, you can instruct it like that, and you have to say drop is false, drop by default is true. If I can simplify, I simplify. Yes, so if I have a three-dimensional array, and I select sort of one slice from that, right, I get a, a two-dimensional array. That is the simplification. That is usually you want this but you can override it, so it's not always. So this, this is useful to, to know. Uh, another thing is that you can, of course, uh, do this, and that is, again, similar to the list selection, right? So from a list, I sel so this is, you know, this might be difficult to understand that this selects the first column, but if you think back on the, that, that DF is actually a list, I get back a list uh, with the first list element, which is this column, but it's still a list. It's a data frame, it's a list. Yeah, so think of the, of the, if you think data frames are lists, then this makes sense. If you don't think that, it doesn't make sense. So if you do this selection on a raster, on a raster object, you get the first cell, right? So it's, uh, it's not always the, so, um, 
and then here we are, right? So how does how do so people get used to uh, selection options because selection is an important thing uh, in in data analysis. So you do it everywhere. Sort of do this on that on these data, do that on that data, and so on. So uh, these square brackets and how the syntax with the commas and so on uh, works are important, and and it's then always a challenge to sort of port these ideas to to new data structures. So I was here where the way I did I went through. I said yes, you can you can select a, a record. You can select a record and keep the data frame structure, return the data frame. You can select a column. Uh, by default, that simplifies. You can select a column by just taking the first you know list element that does not simplify. You can extract the first list element, which is a vector again, and that simplifies. This is what what a list does. Uh, this is similar to to this basically, right? You you return a list at just that you address by name instead of by position, uh, and you can also select more than one thing by by giving um, positions or names. And you can use the dollar operator, which extracts a vector, and then you can replace and you can replace parts of things. Yeah, so this is a bit of a funny construction where you basically assign part of it. What happens here is that the whole Essentially, the whole object A gets replaced by a new object, but you don't see it. So it looks it looks as if you just as if you just replace this vector. That is what the syntax suggests. But basically, you override a complete uh, you override a complete object with a new version. That that is that that has that intended effect. So these are the things that you don't need to know, uh, you, as, as long as your data are not like. Uh, five gigabytes or so, because then you will discover that it's not. It's not as uh, as friendly as it as syntactically looks. Um, right. So this is all um, elementary R, and then these kind of these ideas go into you know got copied into all kind of useful things on spatial and temporal. Well, we we hope useful things in spatial and temporal data that I will now go into. Um, a little note that I made that I also uh, sort of stress on all my students uh, in in the R programming courses that I give in uh, that I give in Munster is. Uh, is the value of functional programming? So we looked at so we looked at a few small programming examples yesterday in, in Robert's class where we use for loops and you so that when when Robert needs to do something he will not write for loops but he will use applies on matrices, right? So whenever you can do something at a at sort of at a higher level than a for loop, then you try to do that, right? So you typically uh, so and and that that technique is called functional programming and that. Is it sort of that means that you don't work on sort of data structures by going through each element, by but rather by thinking what is happening to each element and applying what is happening on each element to the whole data structure. Yes, and that is called an apply. So it's 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 kind of a higher level uh, a higher level of uh, so the example that Robert uh, gave was basically where you. When you have a matrix of uh, observations, uh, of matrix of numbers, and for each uh, row you wanted to have the minimum, right? And then you could, of course, go through the rows in a for loop, and within that for loop, go over all the columns and sort of, you know, take, you know, copy the minimum, sort of take, keep the minimum in mind, and sort of report it every time. I report it every time, I report it every time. But you can also sort of say, oh, I have a function called min, I apply it to all of the rows. Yes? And that really works, works like that in the sense that uh, I'm, I'm showing this again. So if you have a matrix with random numbers uh, that is 10 by 10, um, yes, uh, I can apply to this matrix to the rows, for instance, it's the first dimension. I can uh, apply the function min, and I get the ten minima of the row minima, right? So apply something to, I apply something to a dimension, and this is a very powerful thing because it's not only working on matrices; it also works on any arrays, right? And any array dimension. So if I have like an eight-dimensional array, and I want to get a minimum over the last four dimensions, eight-dimensional arrays are pretty difficult to. But let's take the five-dimensional we could think of, right? Spatial, altitude, uh, temporal, and multi-attribute. Yeah, so five-dimensional. And I want, for instance, for every layer, 
the minima over all time, right? And over all attributes. So you can point out, you know, go over space, go over time, go over, uh, uh, go over attributes, but do it for all the layers. And then I get the minima for all the layers. And it's an, it's an expression exactly as simple as this, or it should be as simple as this. Yeah, so uh, it, it avoids thinking, uh, you know, complicated thinking about dimensions. It allows you to directly work on a high level, sort of think of, of, of dimensionality of problems. Um, and applies works on, on arrays and matrices. L apply works on lists. So the whole sort of machinery in SP, and, and I also think raster is basically completely sort of works only with L applies and, and do that call. This is all called functional programming uh, material. Uh, an important function that I may get back later a little bit is that of aggregate. aggregate aggregation is something that we often do. Um, how can I aggregate? Yes, so think of an aggregate example. Um, so it's just so generally created matrix? Oh, yes, yes, sure, yes, like this. So I, I created 100 values out of a standard normal distribution, and that gives me a vector, and then the function matrix converts it in a matrix, takes as arguments the number of rows and the number of columns. So nothing unexpected there. I could also, I, um, I mean, I could also take the numbers 1 to 100, uh, and then you will understand the result better. Uh, and also, if I do it over the columns, you will also understand the result even better. Um, where was it? Ah, yes, I was going to say something about aggregate. Yeah, so aggregate is a function that, uh, so aggregate is, is we, well, I went, I went into this meaningful spatial prediction and aggregation paper, right? So aggregation was in the title there. So we had a lot of, and actually Christoph Sash, his PhD was on uh, aggregation of spatial temporal, spatial temporal aggregation uh, in, in the sensor web. So in, in sort of environmental sensing data. Um, and, and we've given it a, a bit of thought. There is an aggregate in uh, R. Uh, and so, um, so it's in package stats. Yeah? So R has an aggregate function. And what does it do? So it aggregates data, obviously. It's what it says. It splits the data into subsets, then computes summary statistics for each, and result, returns the result in a convenient form. Well, that sounds too good to be true, right? <laughs> so let's let's try. Um, so of course we have then to th to think how to split the data into subsets. Yes, um, and I could an example is the uh, the Muse data set that they often use, which contains uh, heavy metal. Uh, so had Muse data. Uh, contains heavy metal concentrations in, in topsoil, cadmium, copper, lead, zinc concentrations of PPM uh, at different spatial locations, same data that I showed with it in, the, in the introductory slides. And has a couple of other properties there, so organic matter, flood frequency, soil, lime class, and so on. So let's see if, if flood frequency is, you know, flood frequency is related to, so the idea is here that Flooding of this area is a floodplain that the dirty sediment with the heavy metal pollution came from, you know, from a bordering country. I won't mention which one. They played football yesterday, last night. Um, and that has, you know, deposited sed sediment here that with, with heavy metal concentrations that would uh, sort of classify most of the area as, as chemical waste, uh, essentially. So uh, I think they sort of duck the whole area away now and sort of used it for building roads. Uh, but anyway, this was 20 years ago and it was still there. Um, so let's think if we can aggregate um, aggregate this data set, the, for instance, the cadmium and uh, lead values um, for uh, the flood frequencies, yes, over the flood frequencies, yes, so that I get average values by flood frequency. 
Um, now it will complain if I do this, I know because I tried out, it says, oh, argument function is missing. Yes, I need to say a function. So I wanted mean values, so give me means, yes? Well, again, uh, complain, it says by must be a list. You think by, I don't see a by. Aggregate, second argument, oops, there are two aggregates now. Aggregate in stats, its second argument is by. So by needs to be a list, and it does say so, it's just that I didn't go so far down reading what by must be. By is a list of grouping elements, each as long as the variables in the data frame x. So x is a data frame, by is a list of grouping elements. So flood frequency is a, a grouping element. Look, it's, it's numbers, one, two, threes. So that's fine. It's just not, I just didn't pass it as a list. And the reason it must be a list is that there can be more than one. So if I have two, then, then you know, how would I offer it? I could offer it as a data frame, but it's also a list. Um, so now it does this, right? So instead of the whole data set, that is 155 observations, I now get my cadmium and lead mean concentrations by group, yes, where the group is defined as my flood frequencies. So the mean cadmium concentration on the flood frequency class 1 is 5, and then the mean under class 2 is 0.9, and the mean under class 3 is 1.6. Uh, so this is a very convenient form of sum of aggregate of, of of summarizing data sets by by aggregate values per subgroup. I can of course compute the overall means very easily uh, by basically doing an apply um, you know on this data set uh, apply mean on the columns. Yes, I also get of course column means or or or, or you know use some more complicated construct. Uh, I hope you don't learn. Um, right, so, and, and as I mentioned, there can be more grouping. There can be another uh, uh, where, was, where was my data? There can be another grouping thing, for instance, the lime class. I can sort of include that uh, or the soil type. Let's, let's do the soil type. Soil. And then I get a combination. So I get, so it goes through the combinations of the flood frequencies Soil type 1, flood frequency 2, soil type 1, flood frequency 3, 2, and so on. So it looks at all combinations. Not all combinations are present. You see here that two, uh, uh, 1, 3 is not present. Yeah? So for all combinations that have values, it reports the mean values for, um, for these group combinations. And you can make that as complicated as you want. Um, the nice thing about this aggregation is so I can control the subgrouping. I can also, call, I can also control the type of aggregation. And what I do here is that I actually uh, pass a function as an argument, yes? So mean is a function, it's a generic, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a function that is uh, being called uh, on the data, and I pass it as an argument. So aggregate does something with some function, and I can control this function. So this is the same thing as apply. Uh, aggregate also does this. I can also compute a minimum. I can compute a maximum. I can uh, even compute the uh, median or the, or the 25 percentile, right? Quantile, of course, that needs a parameter. I need to pass the parameter and I give it 25. So I compute the 25 percentile. So even parameters that I want to, that I want to pass on to functions that I pass as arguments to my aggregation function are being passed on there, right? So this is functional programming. So you have sort of high-level ideas that are completely generic, work with every function that you pass it. You just pass the function and the arguments it needs. Yes? You can make your own functions well. And you can make your own functions, exactly. Yes. So think, you know, think like somebody does a fancy interpolation algorithm and you have a particular covariance function that you want to try out. You just pass your covariance function in that interpolation algorithm. And, you know, it's, it's very, so it's very sort of scales up very well. And these are things that are not uh, possible with, for instance, Java or something like that, where you don't have these kind of constructs. It's not non-functional. A Java 8 will be, by the way, uh, for good reasons. So, uh, yeah, so this is uh, a, a thing that uh, 
interests me. So also because we are working with functions, right, to define these types, and it's a, it's a nice concept. Um, so now time. So how is time uh, how is time represented in R? Um, I'll briefly go through that. Um, so there are two main. So R itself, you know, base R as you install it, uh, does not have any support for spatial data. So it has support for data. And you can argue, well, X and Y are just, you know, latitude and longitude are just coordinates of everything else. In that sense, it supports it, but it won't know, right? That it's, so if you make a map, you typically want to have, you know, one kilometer north thing equals one kilometer east thing. So you can control these things, but you have to think every time yourself. So that's why we added packages like SP and Raster to, to take care of that. R itself has support for time and f quite well. Yeah? So it has several uh, ways to represent Time. So there is the uh, POSIX T, as I mentioned. There is the uh, the function that gives me the current time, and um, and this this is basically a string that we see. Yes. So system the time gives the time, not as a string. This is the the way it's printed. Yes. The time, of course, is a number. So if I say as numeric. Uh, system time, it will give me a number, and if I do it a little bit later, it gives me a different number. So this is a number that measures seconds. Yeah, so it is a number, so understanding this number means that you know where it starts and, and how long it takes to go from one to the next one. Uh, and this is seconds, and this is seconds since 1st of January 1970, right, which is one convention. Uh, but you don't have to worry very much about that. So this gives you the time, and I think it even works with milliseconds. It basically gets the you know the time from your from your operating systems. Operating systems pretty know pretty know well about about time in your own computer because they have to, you know, they write the stems of the the date stems of files and so on when you do things. So so this is integrated, of course, with the with the computer itself. Um, uh, another uh, is sys.date. Yeah, sys.date is another way of dealing with time that gives you the date. As an integer, um, so a date counts the number of days since the first of January 1970. Uh, you don't have to know that, but it's a way to represent uh, dates. Um, as you see, time has a time zone, and you can sort of time zones are, you know, are convenient because they tell you that you're different from here and from the from the UK or something like that. Um, and they also, uh, you know, they complicate. So sometimes it's easier to to do as if you know, as if everything you do is in is in UTC or GMT or something like that, because um, at least then, uh, well, for instance, if you look at time series and you would look at duration of of days, then you find out at some stage the days are most of the time 24 hours, and some of them are 23, others are 25, and then you think, uh, you know, what to do next. Uh, so that is time. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, classes that I think are year month or year quarter that are also sort of numeric representations of month months or of uh, quarters, which makes it easy to work with those. Uh, and and then there are packages that do uh, that do time series analysis. So uh, or time series data first of all. So there is a function called TS, and that is in stats. Yes, and TS. <coughs> is used to create time series objects. Yes, so I can, I, if I have data, I can sort of represent it as a time series object. TS objects are regular. Yes, so are, they are they have a regular time. You can see here. I need a start. I need an end, and I need a frequency. Yes, because I have a frequency, it must be regular. So I can go to the examples here. Uh, example. TS, run the examples. Oops, I'm going to do things here. Show me time series. Very good, good. And put all kind of things in my workspace. Oops, lag plot of New Haven temperatures. Uh, so anyway, I have now, for instance, the object Z. You can see here, uh, Z is, uh, is a times is a TS object. Uh, it's even more complicated. It's a matrix, it's a TS, and it's an MTS, meaning multivariate time series, right? So, uh, but it's in any case, it's a regular object, 
where the frequency is monthly, so whether that is regular or not, I mean the, you know, it is the, the length of the months is of course not the identical, um, and then has values for three different things. Yeah, so it is essentially it's a matrix. Yes, it's it's you could you could see it as a matrix. Uh, a ma matrix then basically shows the same thing and has has this as row names, uh, and um, and the, the record the rows. Re reflect single time instances. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Why, why would it be represented as a different class if, it, if the matrix seems to represent? Well, uh, yes, very good question. Um, so, um, w the question is why is this a, 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 why, a, why do I not stick it like a matrix. Why don't they operate with it like a matrix? Well, the question would be, how would you find out the times of the rows? How would you first of all uh, discover that rows reflect time instances or time periods? Doesn't tell which it does. Uh, how, would you, how would you plot the data if you would plot them and you only knew they were a matrix? So there's nothing wrong. As I said, the mathematicians think the world is written in linear algebra meaning my data are always a matrix, in, in special cases a vector, or a higher dimensional array, uh, and, uh, and I'll keep track of everything myself, yes? Trust me, but I will not show you my script, <laughs> yes? That is their that is mathematician's attitude, and that might work, right? I mean, they might do things right, the right way, if they do it, if they do it well. Uh, but it, is, it communicates very difficult. Yeah. So if I give m my data to you and you want to look at them and it's a matrix, so how do I tell you that the first record was January 90, 1961 and, and so on? Yeah, so it's, it's very convenient that the data structures actually know about this. And I can, of course, make a matrix that's only a matrix which has row names with January 1961, February 1961, and so on. So I might discover later on. But if I plot it, you know, how would the plot function know that this is a time series? Or if I would sort of put this into an autocorrelation function or so, how would that know that this is a time series and that rows and that rows are time instances and what the time step is. Yeah, so uh, this thing, it probably has um, a number of attributes. Uh, and the attributes, so attributes are kind of additional pieces of information glued onto objects, I would call them. Right, so we have the, the data. That you, you could think of it as data, as, as metadata, uh, but it's it, it's more. It's basically part of the data, it properties that are not like observations, but properties of the data object. And we see the things here. Uh, we ha don't have dim names one, so we don't have um, we don't have a record. We don't have row names. The thing doesn't even have row names, although it prints them. Um, the thing has uh, column names, dim names too. Dim names is a matrix property where this is the dimension names for the first dimension, it's the row names, the second dimension, the column names. And then it has properties of the side, let's say the time, time series parameters or so, which is the start, which is the end, and which is the frequency. Yeah, where these things are not encoded as as time objects, they're just numbers. This is just a number, this is just a number. This is a number. So it doesn't know really that it's so, this is probably sort of implicit that it now knows how to, that to put a, to put a, I don't know how it, I don't know how it knows that these are months, how, they were, how to put the months in front of it. I think when I convert it to matrix, let's see, uh, whether it's still the same. Yeah, it's still the same, it doesn't change. So there's ma some magic going on. Um, I don't think it, this will work very well. No, this just puts it in a one row matrix. Um, yeah, so this is a so this is a structure that that deals with time series data that are regularly disc, disc, regularly discretized. <coughs> Although I I would dispute uh, that that sort of you know cutting the year in twelve equal pieces gives you months. 
Um, it's not for nothing that meteorologists uh, or climate scientists uh, take the year as having 360 days each month, 30 days, right? So there are net CDF files that have this, this there is a, a field in net CDF files that tells you how many, year, how many days the year has. Might be 360 because it's so much more convenient, right? Um, who could ever thought about leap years? Um, okay, so that is that. So then we have uh, then we have two packages, Zoo and XTS. And Zoo and XTS are important because they do much more with uh, with time data. Yes, they let you do all kind of essential things with them. So. Um, uh, Zoo is, is uh, stands the OO stands for ordered observations, so they are ordered observations, and they can be time ordered. But the thing is, that they are ordered, and, and Zoo doesn't care how they are ordered; they are ordered. XTS is more stringent, builds on Zoo, but says, "Well, my data have to be time ordered, and need I need a time? I actually need POSIX CT uh, time stamps for my observations." The nice thing that happens here is that they have aggregate methods. So when I have minute data, I can go to hourly data. When I have daily data, I can get to monthly data. I can do. I have aggregate methods that let me aggregate time series to an arbitrary new discretization. It is extremely convenient. So this is one thing. The other thing they have is uh, dealing with missing values. If I have missing values, I can fill them in either with the last or with the next or with linear interpolation, with some spline interpolation, all kind of machinery relatively simple machinery there is to deal with uh, with gaps in time series uh, and then there is uh, both do not you know do not um, I will I will show a, a few things because it's basically I try to reuse everything that's an XT in uh, space time so we will get there as well XTS uh, example of an XTS give me some data uh, well it gives you not, not surprisingly, gives you financial data, open, high, low, close. So these are uh, the price of some stock at the opening of the market, the high of the day, the lowest of the day, and the close, closing price uh, for a particular date. So these are daily uh, price data. And here you see that uh, a selection takes place. So in essence, this is again the matrix, yes, where rows are taken as time, uh, but I can do sort of clever selections that are meaningful in the terms of... Uh, of time, right? So I can say, uh, give me the value of um, the 3rd of uh, January 2007, right? Or give me the value um, from the 3rd of from the 3rd of January to the 10th of January. Right, and it does that. So, it has a syntax um, that is very convenient to do selections on time. And you might not be surprised that this will give me all the data of January. Yes, or if I say 2000 and 2007, it gives me all the data for 2007 and so on. Uh, so it it makes it life much very much easy that you don't have to think about which records you know and indicate record 15 until uh, 237 or so, but you can directly sort of point to a particular period. And the way that it does that uh, is, the top of my head, um, is the ISO 8601. Um, Data elements and interchange formats, information exchange, represents a representation, uh, representation of mm, dates and times is an international ISO standard covering the exchange of date and time related data. Yeah, so it kind of, and, and there is, this, is, this is the standard where these kind of funny strings come from, and you may have seen them. These are the ISO 8601 standards to represent date and time information as as text elements yeah where of course in the database underneath in r in the database everywhere they are represented by numbers but to communicate them to understand these numbers we want to have these represented we have we want to think year date etc right so without doing all the math and then uh, and if somebody does the math then this is very convenient so 
are those the math um, if your data are time series data XTS does the dirty work for you yes. uh, as I mentioned XTS only sort of deals with a single type yeah so all my records have to be numeric or have to be logical or something like but have to be of a single type Ah, uh, this is just an example. So I ran the example. So I do that quite often. Uh, I ran the example of XTS. So uh, XTS uh, is the function that you use to create XTS objects. That is also not very surprising or sort of a regular convention. And if I go to its help page, I see... <coughs> I see uh, the syntax and so on explained what I need to do. Of course, that is way too much work. So I just drop and sort of go to the example. And the examples are here. And I can then, of course, copy and paste, you know, copy this text and paste it to my R se uh, session. Uh, but that is so much work. And I do it so often that R is clever enough to sort of do, run the examples by the command example. Example, XTS runs the examples of XTS. And, and we sort of developers try to, you know, write code to where the examples illustrate things. So it is, it is a very useful thing to know. I'll, I'll point you to more useful things. There was a question here, yes, Jafir. Yeah. Okay, good. Yes, what can I do with these? Yes. Yeah. So first of all, these are, as I mentioned, these are not data frames. I can't have a column with a category here and a logical here. These are matrices. But that is usually not such a problem. You know, I mean, you either work with one or the other type. So that is not a big showstopper. Um, but what can I do with them? Well, um, you can, for instance, well, let's, you know, let's see what happens if I plot it. <laughs> it will warn me. It says only the univariate time series will be plotted. Yeah, so apparently, XTS only knows about univariate time. But what it plots, the plot it gives me is quite different from when I would have passed the matrix to the plot. It plots me time series. And here you see this is something you don't want to program yourself, right? That sort of the, 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 the date ticks and so the date axis uh, is there. So it knows that X, my rows are times and that I want to have a line, the timeline as in then it does all kinds of other things that you may, like, may, may or may not like, but it gives you the usual time graph. So if I have a column with dates in the ISO standard, I can convert it into a TS. And, and an XTS, yes. As is, as is. Well, this, I'm looking at XTS now. XTS is irregular times. TS is regular time series. Okay. So if you have really da daily data, this is not really daily data because the weekends are closed, markets are closed. So this is weekdays. Yeah, so this is this came from the financial people where they have semi-regular data, which is you know regular during opening of markets. You had a question too. Um, I guess if you're interested in calculating like the difference in time between points, how can you figure out what's the best format for your date, date time data? Uh, sorry, could you repeat how that? Can you figure out what's the best format to store um, date time data? Uh, you mean the time points, the time instances? Yeah, if you want to do calculations, like say calculate the difference in minutes between one, one point and another point, how can you figure out what format to have your information in? Good, uh, good question, yes. So the question is, so how should I represent, you mean whether I should use date or POSIX-CT? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I think the answer there is if you have daily data, you use dates. If you have like a higher temporal timing, higher sort of uh, more detailed timings, then you use POS60. Resolution? Yes, resolution, yes. 
I was thinking granularity uh, for some reason. Um, right, so I get the times by asking for index. Uh, and they are now, uh, let's see, they are, they are, it looks like they are, um, sorry, they are POSIX CT, yes. So in this case, they, the times are POSIX CT. I could then convert them into date, s.date, and I get the dates, right? So that, that takes off the minute information and so on. Um, so there you can exchange between one and the other. But these are the, the times of the XTS time series are POSIX-T. Uh, and then I can, indeed, I can uh, compute differences between time points uh, and the differences, um, <coughs> there is a function called difference that, that computes the difference between consecutive elements and that says time difference. And that tells me, it gives me the time differences, yes, in days, yeah, so that is very that's a very friendly. It gives me numbers, but it also gives me the units of the numbers. So uh, the the class of this thing is a diff time. Yes, so it's a number. So of course it's a numeric. It's as the numeric. Uh, it has numbers, but it also has attributes that tell me what the uh, class is, but also what the units are, right? So if you plot things, if you want to plot changes over time, sort of day-to-day -day changes, then you can also tell, well, these are day-to-day -day changes, and the unit of this is days, right, of differences. Have you ever used Lubridate? Uh, Lubridate. Lubridate, no. That is, I, I'm aware of it, yes. There is a package called Lubridate, and Lubridate does a little bit more than this because it has more intricate classes. It comes from the, the sort of the Wickham side of uh, sort of computing. Uh, makes it easier to work with dates and times, providing functions to identify and parse the time date, daytime data, extract and modify components of things. That is what POSIX CT can do too, LT. Perform accurate math on day times. Well, we could do that. Handle time zones, we could do that. Handle daylight saving times, we could do that. Lubridate has a consistent, memorable syntax. Oh, that's important. That makes working with dates fun instead of frustrating. So, no, I was not frustrated. It made my life easier to plot especially. Okay. Well, if they can plot, that is, of course, useful. Uh, things that they did uh, also that I liked was uh, representing time intervals. Yeah, so, but I don't think that they represent time series data. So I think they represent just you know sequences of times or, sequ or, or time intervals, rather than uh, dealing with time series data objects. So it makes dealing with dates a little easier, but not with time series data. So uh, I don't know. Yeah, it it can. I, I mean, it's, it's it should be worth a look. Um, and it actually appeared for the first time after uh, I was started. I made critical decisions in. Uh, uh, so it appeared for the first time in 2010. That is after I started working on space time. So I never, I didn't uh, sort of consider it. Uh, I, I considered only what was there at the time. Um, right. So, okay. So what is the what is the lunch time break? Time, lunch break. In is it half past twelve? Okay. Um, okay. So then, um, yeah. So okay. Then I okay. I, I, I'll, I'll then continue because I want to st st stop, sw jump over time now. Uh, I want to point you to the task view. So if you cannot find task views, then you should now uh, pay attention. So you go from a cron mirror. Uh, when you're on the cron, it says comprehensive R archive network, right? It's not the R homepage. On the R homepage, it says the R project for statistical computing. You go from there, you can go to a cron mirror. You have to search a cron mirror. Uh, and on cron mirrors, you see on the left hand side, you see the task views, right? So task views are important because they guide you sort of in the, you know, in the wild, in the wild of the five and a half thousand R packages that are there. And I want to point you to a few. Roger did that too already earlier. 
uh, want to point you to the spatial one, the spatial temporal one, and the time series one. Right? There is a task queue on time series that tells you everything about time series. It tells you about basics infrastructure. Yes. It tells you about times and dates, what I just told you, what the time classes there are, and so on, and different packages that have other things. Uh, and about time series classes, so that means objects that represent temporal information. And you see there's like 10 packages that do that. And then analyzing, so forecasting and univariate modeling. Yeah, so all the types of time series models we do. So I could you know, spend a week talking about time series forecasting or ARIMA modeling or things like that. There is, as you see, can see, there's quite a bunch, like I would estimate 30, 40 packages that offer all kinds of things besides the things that are already there in base, in base R. Uh, of course, it mentions forecast as the first one, which is, of course, you know, by the author, Rob Hindman. Um, so these, all these, you know, these things are, of course, biased looks on things, but um, different things. Frequency analysis, decomposition, filtering, seasonality, um, stationarity, all kind. Of, oh, and then it gets advanced here. Continuous time models, resampling, time series data, miscellaneous. It's large. So let's see, there's a lot. There's a lot of uh, infrastructure in R and in R add-on packages to you know to do some things, all kind of different things with time series data. So if you're interested in, if you're looking for a particular thing, look there first. Same thing for spatial and spatial-temporal. Um, yeah, so these are task queues. Mm. Uh, hopefully we will look in the afternoon to Tom's data, which also has time uh, in it, to the contest data. Uh, so then I want to jump, very, very briefly talk about spatial data. Uh, there, are, there are all kinds of spatial objects in SP, spatial points, spatial lines, spatial... Polygons, spatial grids, or pixels, five things, and all of them can have a data frame, can have attribute data with them. There are all kinds of things in raster that we learned about yesterday. There are packages that let you import or export your data to all kinds of formats or databases in RGDAL. There is a package that does geometrical operations, as we've seen, like buffering, intersections, and so on, does all the topolo topological operations that's called RGOs. I said see task queue, yeah, so for to see whatever uh, whatever is there. Um, what I wanted to get back is that we try to, in, in, in any case, in this, all the spatial star objects, we try to uh, work with a syntax that is similar to how we organize our data and data frames. Yeah, so if I have, uh, I had my Muse data already loaded, so if I say, well, convert this into a uh, into a and I have SP loaded as well. Convert this into a uh, spatial points data frame. Uh, I can do that by telling what are the coordinates. Yes, this is a bit, a bit funny syntax. Um, the coordinates of, of, of the Muse data sets are called X and Y. Yes, I can do it like this. You can also even shorter is using the formula syntax. Um, like this, oops already been set, uh, reloaded and set it. And now my Muse data are, um, are, a, are a spatial points data frame. So it understands now this object knows I'm, I'm spatial data, right? So if I, plot my, if I plot it, I'm not gonna plot everything. I'm just gonna plot, um, I'm just gonna plot the locations, spatial location. I'm not gonna plot axes because typically maps don't have like axes with numbers because nobody understands them. Although I could, you know, I could, um, I could of course ask for that, and then I see the lines and the big numbers and so on that nobody understands. Um, so it now knows that it is spatial, yes. It knows that it is points, and it knows that it has attributes, right? Like the heavy metal concentrations and so on, like in a data frame. Now what I can do is uh, select records, yes, in the same way that I could. Like I can select the first 10, first five records, like this, and I see that the th only thing that is different is that I see that my coordinates are printed slightly different. This is code that Barry somehow contributed like 10 years ago uh, and, and that stayed there for some reason. I can also specify uh, 
columns, yes, cadmium, select columns, select cadmium, and I only see the coordinates again. So it will keep the coordinates, right? Um, I, can of I can then also sort of uh, extract uh, by using the dollar and say cadmium, and that gives me the first five values, cadmium values. So I can do the similar operation. So these same, same operations are used as much as possible as it was, as it used to be in a, in a, in a data frame. Um, and, and with some extensions to that. Um, so uh, we can select records and variables. We can also select based on the spatial match. Uh, that is, I can also specify instead of the index, I can specify an object and say, here is a spatial object, select, give me the points that are within that object uh, in, a, in, a same, in, a similar, in a similar way, uh, like, um, and there is, an, there is an aggregate. And there is an aggregate, so I, the next thing I wanted you to look at is how spatial aggregation uh, works here. And um, there is an, a vignette that explains that. And uh, I want you to run the code in the vignette. So who of you has never heard of what a vignette is? Okay, very good. So it's time. So who of you knows what a vignette is? Or Yes? One of you when interested in explaining what a vignette is? What is a vignette? It's a PDF where you... A bit of a tutorial which works with the, with the, with the functions of a, of a package. And right. allows you to develop some, some tasks which are intended to do with this package. And it's right. all within a PDF. Right, so it's a PDF. So it's uh, similar to the, the documents that, that Robert showed. It's like a, there is different PDFs. Where do you find PDF vignettes? Where do you find them? You can, you can find them directly in R by, by that setting by net. Right, like vignette. You type vignette over. Of course, you need to know how they are called. Uh, that is a challenge. Um, you probably can get a list somehow. Well, you, just in, in Google, you can just browse it, the name. Let's see if this works. If I say help.start... And then I see, look at my packages. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, a few packages installed here. Uh, then go to, I wanted to have a vignette in SP, so I go to SP and then look at what is there. It's not too fast, right? Well, it's all on localhost, right? No. It's in the local. It's it's not it's not over the internet. It's, it's this is all on a local machine. Um, and I even have the. I mean, I I have the cable, right? The thing that you don't have. Uh, anyway, it's, if this takes maybe it takes long because I have many uh, uh, many packages. So on the cron SP package, you can see that there is different documentation, right? So I hope everyone's familiar with these kind of the package uh, pages. Uh, a, a thing that you will always find there is the reference manual, which is a very the relatively standard, relatively boring document with the index of the functions, right? So you can look at the index of functions and see, is there anything I can use? Um, do I understand what the author meant by all these words? Uh, and go, you know, jump somewhere and you find essentially exactly the same information that you find in the online help. It's generated from a single file, right? This is, it generates the online help, the HTML help that you can get online. Uh, and the PDF that you find here. So every package has to have, that has to be complete. Optionally, packages have vignettes, and vignettes are more useful documents because they, they try to explain something, right? Instead of a collection, alphabetic collection of function descriptions and, and a description of the arguments, they try to explain something. And here is a vignette, and you can sort of see in, sort of see here, you can see it here, that the vignette is called over, that's the file name is over. Um, 
I tried to find it in a different way, but couldn't. Uh, so here's a vignette that explains about map overlay and spatial aggregation in SP uh, that, I, uh, that I worked on. So um, this is text, yeah, so that you can read it, is, and it is intertwined with, uh, with R commands, right? So we have here uh, things happening, yeah? And, and they're being carried out, and then at some stage you see that something happens, right? So I do some command, and something gets out here. Now, as, as Robert mentioned yesterday, this is very inconvenient to, uh, to um, copy and paste from, right? Because there's always the prompt here that does not execute, so you would have to start here and copy and paste, so you don't want to do that. Um, so, as I said, the vignette is... Um, Oh, wow, it's really sort of making itself very busy. Um, uh, the vignette is there as well uh, on your machine. So if I ask for the vignette with the command vignette, then uh, it gives me the vignette. It just takes a while because it has to go through all the packages. So it gives me, the, it opens the PDF for me, so I can look at it locally. I don't have to be online. Um, the interesting thing is that if I say edit vignette, uh, you're not editing the vignette, but you're actually opening a text editor with all the R code that is in the vignette. That is basically, the vignette is a combination of, of text, description, and R code, and they're being pulled together automatically into a final document, right? So we don't, when I, when I, write, a, when I write a vignette, I don't put this here, yes? I only put this here, and then R runs this and outputs this, and the system combines that into, right? So the, the, the R sections are available as well there, and are actually available to you, and you can edit them, you can open them by an editor, and sort of play around and run these commands, and then uh, modify them to your own needs. Yeah, so this is the idea. Uh, where, you can, where you can do this thing. So I want you to try this out uh, and look at this vignette uh, as an exercise and uh, try to run it. So this is very simple. You save it as a file, you source it, or you copy and paste the whole thing to an R session. And then you try to understand what happened. It's, of course, the challenge. Wait, wait. How did you get it into the Into the document? Yeah. I was in R. Okay, no, I just and I said, edit vignette. So vignette, like this, this command, opens the vignette, shows you the PDF, takes it from your disk, it's on your disk, it's parts of the package. No, I get this. I just didn't get the, code. the edit, right, okay, yes, very good. Yeah, okay. Um, and um, so vignettes are, uh, so many of them explain things, so they meant as tutorials, right, as an explanation why something is there and how it works. And then you can do it yourself because all the code is sort of available to you as well. So they're, they're self-generating. Um, so um, so it, it's, it's good to, when you look, when you see packages, it's good if there are vignettes to take a look at these vignettes. So what are these vignettes? What, do they, can, what can I learn from them? Usually they're much more uh, interesting, yes, much more uh, useful than, than the list of functions because they, they introduce you to, to topics and problems. You had a question. If you want to do the same uh, in other packages, how, how do you identify the name of the... Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, yeah, so this thing is still running. Uh, I don't know why. Um, oh, and now it has something. Um, so here, if I get so if I go to the help system help dot start, I typed help dot start, but it somehow it somehow halted. Yes, here, help dot start. Maybe you have, maybe on our studio or something like that, this works differently. I don't know, right? Maybe you have a button for this or so. I don't. This my R does not have buttons, uh, but there's a command called help dot start, that starts a browser, pointing to the root of the local browser, browsable HTML documentation tree on your machine that includes all the packages. 
Yeah, so all documentation is of course online, but it's also local. Help.start will open a browser to it locally. So then I went in the help.start, I went to packages, and then it opened my list of 500 packages, and then I uh, selected SP, so you see here the help of SP, and then it says there's the description file, there's user guides, package vignettes, and other documentation. Click. Yes, and that should tell me, should give me the vignettes, except that it takes ages to. For some reason, it it takes endless on my computer, endless to to load. So they are. Uh, so they are available uh, from the from the local HTML help system, and the other thing I just mentioned uh, was um, that here I, mm, but that is cheating, I admit. Yes, I put my mouse pointer on the on the Viet name, and then you can see uh, how it's called, it's called the URL. You can see how it's called. You see, it's called over.pdf. So it opens with vignette over. But that is cheating, I admit. Yes, It's just that I got used to it. <laughs> I'm not so, you know, primitive. As long as it's predictable, I don't care if it's primitive. Um, right. Um, um, and, and the... Uh, mm, so in in a, to to summarize that in in like uh, in like a few words um, uh, the 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 over command does overlay sort of does matches of one thing with the other and then what you can do with that if you have matched one thing you can you know compute uh, aggregates over these matches yeah so an example that happens here is that I um, match pixels with a line or aggregate uh, interpolated value on a fine grid in pretty coarse uh, grid cells. But so you can follow my activity on, 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 on Dropbox. I don't know how to put it off. Um, anyway. Simon. Shh. Um, so, uh, so aggregate uh, basically uses uh, um, Aggregates one thing, yes. Given an aggregation predicate, which which used to be sort of the, the the classes for every record, but here you don't give the classes, but you give another objects, for instance, grid cells, and it, it will compute the aggregates of the thing in the grid cell for this grid cell and put it in the grid cell and and return you the grid cell with the new aggregated values. So it's 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 a wrapper about the simple, uh, the simple tabular record wise aggregation directly to spatial data based on spatial predicates, uh, spatial attributes, and moves them into the new sort of new topology. So you can go from anything to anything, from lines to polygons, from points to grids, and so on. Uh, well, it, it has its limits, but. Um, I was wondering, you know, with these yes. uh, PDFs, it has the codes in it, but as you've seen, when you paste them into R, sometimes they don't paste correctly. Is there any way that these are linked to this is this is what I just tried to point out to you. I said the v PDFs are locally available on your machine, so the PDFs open if I said vignette with vignette name. If I say edit vignette, then it opens an edit text editor with the R code, and that is R code that you can directly throw into your R session. Are you R Studio? Are you R Studio users? Yes. So so here we are. So here are we are in a uh, in a nice situation that our studio is not our. <laughs> yes, and I regret that. I mean, our studio is being you know does some, a lot of things very good, solves problems that other people don't have, but also introduce problems that other people don't have. Uh, I think that Ben uh, Benedict, my my PhD student who is arriving tonight, uh, will teach tomorrow. I believe that he can explain to you how it works. I remember he did once. You can get it out of, out of the help? Yeah, you just go to help, and then you go to the yes, and then it's the R file. Ah, OK. So. 
And you do that all in R Studio? No, just, in, just, in, uh, in R. just in R. So you start with help.start? The no, HTML. Mark, uh, <coughs> oh, okay. Right, because on R Studio it directly opens the HTML yeah. help, right? Yeah. It also may require a specific package and start there. No, it? no, I don't think so. No, it's, uh, it's, I don't think it's, I don't know exactly what it was. I forgot the solution because I j just remembered it's an R Studio problem. I'm not interested in solving R Studio problems. So I'm interested in R problems, but not in R Studio problems. They should solve that. Sorry? It? R Studio should solve that. R Studio should solve it, yes, yes. Well, they solved an enormous problem for me. They, uh, they added uh, uh, VI key bindings, right? So my editor is, is VI. It's something very old fashioned. And they did sort of, R Studio can do that too now. It's, it's very friendly, just not everywhere, but anyway. Um, yeah, so yeah, so there are, we, we have that uh, more often on, uh, by the way, this is one example, smaller, but we have it more often on, if there are questions on mailing lists that people do things, get run into problems, do things in our studio and run into problems and that we can't reproduce. So then basically the first step to do is to do it outside of our studio and see if the problem remains, right? So be prepared of that. Be, I mean, don't assume that our studio and R are the same working systems. So people who work with R but not with our studio cannot reproduce these problems. That is, our studio can. Um, okay, so that's vignettes. So vignettes, so and, and understanding, reading vignettes is very important. Understanding how you can run these code is, is even more, because this is, this is where we, package authors, basically put our effort in, right? This has the widest audience. All the, all the package users can see this. It's integrated. It's on the websites. It's integrated in the help system. So you can read them. You can click on the PDFs. You can click on the R file, run the R file, and, and modify, right? Run it for your own example. So man, lots, lots, lots of... So look at... Uh, you know, look at uh, uh, packages like uh, RCPP, which gives you a, an interf a very fast interface to uh, C++. Look at the number of vignettes it has, right? It is essentially the whole Springer book of uh, Derek Adam Boodle, I think. Um, not 100% sure, but uh, so there's a lot of effort being put in. Two vignettes. By some people, of course, or other people, they completely ignore it and, and don't understand it. Are there any questions? I guess it's we should otherwise slowly head to lunchtime. And I will promise to talk much less in the uh, in the afternoon. I maybe try to do things. Yeah, but I, at least I gave you a, a task now to to do. Maybe I should start talking later in the lunch. Try to do things. Okay, so good lunch. <laughs>